and all the students that uh, helped to me coming and suggesting to do and to implement new things and so it's, uh, it's, it's really a great experience so I, I am pretty sure that René will enjoy a lot doing this job for the Institute. Thank you. Okay, well, I had the pleasure to introduce today to the speaker. Um, you know, the speaker is a member of our department of uh, radio astronomy and uh, galactic structure department. And it is the only reason because I am here and this uh, and this desk. And well, there is another reason, another important reason. It's a very good friend of me, right? So. Uh, everybody knows uh, Martin Guerrero. Martin Guerrero arrived to this uh, route to home, to our house, in 2003. And since then, he has been one important scient scientist of this institution, in particular working in planetary nebulae. And uh, he uh, studied in uh, Canary Island, yeah. all right? But, uh, in Canary Island, the, the grad uh, of the only the, the PhD. No, I did the grad in Madrid. In All right. Okay. So the grad was in Madrid, the Complutense in the Complutense University, and the PhD was in Madrid. Right. Okay. So the grad was in Madrid, the Complutense in the Complutense University, but the PhD was already done in the IAC in Canary Island, uh, already working on planetary nebula. Afterward, he was, uh, you know, a telescope operator in Roca de los Muchachos Observatory, and finally he went to. Uh, USA to University of Illinois, Urban Champaign, also working in the problems uh, connected with the uh, planetary nebula. Anyway, I, I take the opportunity to publicly thank him the important role he has played in the last four years as vice director of this institute. In fact, uh, Martin has been not only an excellent scientist, an excellent researcher, uh, doing very important science, as you can see in this uh, talk, but also has been an excellent manager, able to be concerned with many of the problems that an institute of this size every day present, as the people that already are taking, you know, uh, the new role in the new team uh, already knows. So I think that, uh, particularly me and everybody in this institution, has to be uh, grateful to him for this important role. Well, coming back to science, the uh, talk today is, uh, well, the, uh, how to say, the advisement is a nature cover. That is an important introduction because it has an important impact in many aspects. But behind the nature cover, it is a very important uh, new result. In fact, it opens a new way to understand what is happening in the final, uh, in the final evolutionary stage of the intermediate mass stars. And so I let him, you know, to, to eat the dog. Thank you very much. When we started the, the streaming phase of the, of the seminar, and I really appreciate all the effort that you made for, for these uh, seminars. Well, I'm going to be talking today uh, a peculiar planetary nebulae, and then starting with this uh, cartel of, uh, of a movie. How many people have watched this movie. Hands up. Okay, so quite, quite a few people. It's a 1955 movie, masterpiece. Uh, it, it's about a generation of young people, teenagers. They don't find their place in the universe. And so they behave, they are rebel. But they don't know why they, they, they behave this way. Today I'm going to be talking about a planetary nebula, H-U-B-I-1. It's the there in the, in, uh, in the corner. It's rebel, it's behaving bad, it's doing things that no other planetary nebula does, but there is a cause for this. 
So this is a work that I've made with some colleagues here from the IAA, Luis Miranda, Carolina Kerik, some other people, but particularly I'd like to mention uh, Ramos Larios, Gerardo, and Xuan Fang, who were former postdocs of mine here at the, at the IAA. So for those of you that have watched uh, A Rebel Without a, a, a Cause, do you remember where the final plot of the movie takes place? Do you remember the final um, minutes of the movie? Yes. Actually, it happens at the Griffith uh, Observatory. Good memory. I have a prize for you. Uh, at, some, at some moment, these teenagers are taking on a field trip to the observatory. And there, a very formal uh, professor of astronomy is giving a speech about the end of the Earth, of the solar system, of our sun. And he's saying that, well, we will become all dust and gas, which will evolve into space, and there is going to be nothing about us. So that's for these teenagers that we are without a, a reason to, to be. It was really uh, dramatic. And at some moment, they were offering this uh, picture, which is basically the view of Hollywood about the, the end of the sun and, and the solar system. So this talk is going to be about this, about the, the planetary nebula, the final phases in the evolution of low and intermediate uh, mass stars. If you have a significant mass, then you will explode as a supernova. But for those stars that have low and intermediate masses, they will proceed in a different way. So at the very beginning, they are burning hydrogen at their cores. When the hydrogen is exhausted, they started burn, burning hydrogen in a shell something like this, and then they go up in the red giant uh, uh, branch. So after this, they get the, uh, the possibility to burn helium at the center, so they go into a short phase of the, the horizontal branch here, and then finally they got this configuration where they, there is an, a core of carbon and oxygen. This is inner. Those start, don't have enough mass to, to fresh there so as to produce new elements. And then hydrogen and helium are going to be burning uh, here in, in two different uh, shells. And so they go up to this the red giant branch phase. Actually, hydrogen and helium, is not, they are not burning simultaneously. So for most of the time, it's hydrogen. And the helium shell is building up to a mass when there is a, like a, a helium flash. But it happens inside the star, so nothing really dramatic happens. So at the very end of this evolution, they are going to shed their envelopes into space. The star is going to shrink up to the, the central core, which is very hot, so its temperature is going to increase. And then this increase in temperature is going to produce a higher flux of UV photon, which is going to photoionize the, the shell. So actually, planetary nebula, they are not like the, the big bursts in the universe. They are not gamma ray bursts that explode far away with the biggest explosion. They are not going to, to, to tell us what's the structure of the universe, what's the dark energy in the universe. So we are not going to ask important questions with planetary nebula, but they can teach us a lot of physics. And so we may ask why this planetary nebula, HUBI1, has made out first to a nature astronomy letter and then even to the nature astronomy cover. Here I'm depicting one podcast I found on the, on the web. It's a wonderful piece of uh, outreach. It has so far made like 100,000 uh, views. It's really impressive how this guy teach what's happening in my uh, planetary nebula. And he didn't ask me anything. So I just found this. It's excellent. Masterpiece of uh, outreach. So I'm going to tell you who is HUV1, what's wrong, with, what's going on here in this planetary nebula. Then we think we have the reason that explains this situation, and then why this is important, what's telling us about the, uh, the evolution of the final phases of uh, stellar evolution of low and intermediate mass stars. So everything started with the IRA satellite. The IRA satellite made a, a map of the whole sky in the 
meat and far infrared. And there were many, many uh, sources, point sources that were discovered there. So people immediately started to uh, classify them according to their colors. Um, so it has this uh, telephone number, uh, this, uh, this source. Um, Andrea Prete Martinez compared the colors of already known planetary nebula with sources in the IRAS catalog, and he found one source, this one here, IRAS 17514, that has colors similar to planetary nebula. It's on the line, also it's kind of extreme. So it shows up in his table of true planetary nebula by colors as the source number 188. So this is called also PM1-188. By that time, uh, Hu and Bibo, two uh, Chinese astronomers, were in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam in uh, Holland, they were involved in the uh, analysis of the IDA satellite. So they uh, recognized it was an interesting source, and they made the first uh, spectroscopic observation and um, photometric observation, so they found this is the spectral energy distribution in the infrared that can be described as, as a two temperature uh, black body. So there was a lot of dust there in this uh, source, and they found this spectrum. Actually, if a student of mine gets and say, "Hey, Martin, here is the spectrum of Fabian," and he shows me this, I say, "Well, this is very different to the typical PN spectrum with the H alpha line there." bright oxygen tree, which is not there, and a bunch of emission lines there. So they claimed that was a low excitation PN, probably jump PN, which was just uh, being formed. A bit later, uh, Don Polacco, a great, good friend of mine, um, and Hill, they made a new observation, and they realized that the central star was a WC10 bracket square. So we, we classify the central stars of planetary nebula that have wall fragile features with the WC or WR with bracket square to make a difference with the real through a wall fragile star. And they claim that it's a double shell PN. So that's the, the best image that was in the, in the literature of this uh, PN. So they claim it's a bipolar uh, outer shell. I don't really see the bipolar there, but they claim it's bipolar with a low density and very low excitation. And this is the spectrum with just basically the Barman lines and nitrogen 2 lines. And then the spectrum of the central region that they claim it was compact and very high density with a lot of carbon 2 or carbon 3 emission lines. Actually, we typically measure the density using the uh, ratio of the two of the sulfur to doublet there. But because there are carbon lines there, so actually this line were contaminated in the uh, innermost region. So actually the high density that they claim, it's, it's a mistake, it's, it's wrong, this is not true. Leven Hagen and Wolfram Renner Hamann, they made the first non-LT model of the central star and they recognize that it's a low temperature, kind of low terminal velocity uh, uh, wind. Um, they reclassified as a WC11. It, basically, everything is helium and carbon in the stellar wind of this uh, central star. And just a bit later, Miriam Peña claimed that, well, this is a peony ionized by the cool WC star, which is kind of a star with low mass, which is evolving very uh, slowly. So that was the, the idea about this source by the end of the, by the 2005. And so here is going to start uh, our story. Uh, Luis Miranda and I decided to go through the uh, Olga Suarez spectroscopic atlas of post agb sources, because there, there were many um, low ionization sources that they may be at the very beginning, earliest of the formation of planetary nebula. And so we thought that they were telling us how PN were formed. So we started making uh, images of these sources in the Nordic Optical uh, Telescope. So this is the DSS image of the, of the source. This is the spectrum presented by, uh, by Olga. And then we moved to, to a summer night there at the Nordic Optical Telescope. And I said this is a dream of a summer night because by the time I was observing this PN, I was really dreamy. I was tired after a few nights uh, there. And so I got these two pictures. This is H-alpha 
and nitrogen two pixels, uh, not very impressive. Also, the thing was like 0.7 arc second for this source. And when I saw the image, I said, well, uh, there is something wrong. I'm so sleepy that I have mistaken the nitrogen two filter by the oxygen three filter because the nebula is brighter inside and nitrogen two used to be brighter outside. I'm going to tell you later why. So I check everything and actually, no, I was right. It was the nitrogen two filter. So if you make a combination of the two uh, filters with green as H alpha and red oxygen three, you have something like this. And here is what, I'm, what is really striking about this PN. When you compare with other planetary nebula, independently of the temperature of the central star, if you use the same skin of color, you always have the red, the nitrogen two outside and everything else with higher ionization inside. But here is the opposite. And so we have to go to, to the fairy tales and say, well, Osterbrock, page 32 and page 33, it's telling me that this is the ionization structure of a planetary nebula. And there you have helium-2, which is inside, uh, H-alpha, it's outside, and uh, oxygen plus is here, so oxygen plus behaves like a nitrogen plus. So basically, there was something wrong between the, if comparing theory with the observation that we are carrying on this PN. So we needed more data. Next year, summer, same telescope, same instrument, but now using the spectroscopic mode of, of ALFOS. Again, excellent scene condition, 0.8 arc seconds. We got a, a long slit spectrum going across the PN. And what we found was something like this. So you see here, oxygen two, oxygen plus, is peaking inside. Oxygen plus plus is peaking outside. And helium plus plus is just peaking outside. That's the inner shell of this PN. If you compare with this plot, it's the opposite. Helium two inside, oxygen plus plus in, uh, at the center, and oxygen plus outside. So it's completely opposite. So we, we said that this PN is inside out. It's just the opposite uh, structure. So either the classical astrophysics is wrong, which is uh, hard, to, hard to believe, or maybe the inner shell of this PN is not uh, photoionized. So here I changed from the movie from uh, a rebel without a cause to a different Moving, uh, now I say timber, this is wall, because here I'm going to add more and more elements that I'm going to show you that this PN is really, truly unique. So the first thing I ask Carolina, hey Carolina, I see the helium-2 line here in the spectrum of the inner shell, that's a, a helium-2 line, and the star has a temperature of 35,000 Kelvin. Can you make the numbers for me to make how many ionizing photons do I need? She made the numbers and she said, Martin, it's just impossible. You should not even detect the line here. This central region should not be emitting in uh, helium-2. So when we make a comparison of some shock sensitive line ratios like uh, oxygen plus to oxygen three, Look at the sulfur 2 to H alpha or the uh, oxygen 1 to H alpha line ratios. These are telling us that this is shock excited plasma, what we are seeing. It's not photoionized, it's shock excited. And we made some models with mappings and found that at least we need an expansion velocity of, the, of whatever was moving there of at least 70 kilometers per second. Then if we look at the outer shell, we see H beta, helium one, recombination lines of uh, hydrogen and helium one. But there is almost no forbidden lines. Hmm? That's something funny. And then again, we run some models and we realize that the forbidden lines are very sensitive to the electronic temperature. If the electronic temperature is going down, let's say to 5,000, 4,000 Kelvin, the forbidden lines are going to disappear. So this is a model 
of um, a, a, a bubble of gas where you turn off the central star, and then you see uh, the evolution with time. So you see that uh, the electron temperature is going to drop, and then if you look at the emissivity of some lines, oxygen-3 is going to drop very quickly, and then oxygen-2, and finally nitrogen-2. So if we look at the line ratio that we have now, we are something here. So we have a low temperature, and something happened to these souls, according to this model, which is um, like a toy model, a few hundred uh, years ago. So the outer shell is recombining. And how can it be that the outer shell is recombining? It's recombining because the central star is disappearing. So in the last 45, 46 years, the central star has dimmed by 10 magnitudes. This is the, uh, the discovery, the photometric in Hugh and Bebo uh, paper. And that's July 1996, July 2014, and May 2017. So this, the center star has go down by 10 magnitudes. It's now 10,000 times fainter than it was about 50 years ago. And even though the central star is much, much fainter, if we look at the spectra that we have in 1996 and 2014, they imply about the same stellar parameters. So nothing happened to the central star. The central star has about the same temperature, has about the same uh, chemical composition. So the central star is the same, but we don't see the central star. And if we look at the, at the infrared, we see that there is a lot of infrared emission going up there, which connected to the many carbon-2 and carbon-3 lines. So we believe that there is a lot of dust mostly uh, carbonaceous that dust, which is opaquing the, the central star. So those are the, the facts. This is what's happening in here, and now we need to ask why. Why is HUBI1 experiences this series of unfortunate events? So we have all of this is going on here in this nebula. And our main hypothesis is that there is a carbon-rich high-speed ejector which is absorbing the UV light from the central star. And this happened at least 50 years ago from the time that we have uh, data on the photometry of the, of the star. This kind of processes in planetary nebula, they are associated to uh, thermal pulses, either final thermal pulses here, or late thermal pulses, or very late thermal pulses. So this is going to happen when the star has already left the, the AGB, and the helium shell on the top of the white dwarf, or the star becoming a, a white dwarf, reaches a critical mass to produce a, a helium shell a flash. So depending on where this is going to happen, we call it an uh, AGB final thermal pulse. So in this case, we have something like 20% of, of hydrogen. This is just when the star is leaving the AGB. We may have a late thermal pulse, which is when this is on the track, when it's burning in hydrogen on the, on the horizontal post-AGB track, or it may be a very late thermal pulse when this is already on the cooling track of the, of the white dwarf. So we believe that because the chemical composition, we are probably here in the very late thermal pulse. And actually, uh, Luis Miranda made the calculation as for the age of the outer shell, and he found that it had something like 10,000 years, which is basically what you expect for a very late uh, thermal pulse, or what's called this is a, a born-again episode. There are only four born-again that are known. Those are about 30 which is the shell plus the ejection inside here. Abel 78, this is the nebula, and there is an ejection, um, you see material there, kind of a disk with some polar ejection. Abel 58, which is the, the also known as uh, Nova Aquila 1919, and here again, there is a kind of bipolar uh, ejection there, and the most famous of all these uh, 
sources, which is a born against a Sakurai's object. So Sakurai's object was um, a star which uh, brightened in the mid uh, 90s. It was observed by uh, um, an astronomer, a Japanese astronomer, uh, who realized that there was a new star at the position where there was nothing else. At the very beginning, so they, they thought it was a slow nova, but then they realized that there is a planetary nebula around this. It's a very old planetary nebula. Um, they realized that this is the, the fourth born again uh, planetary nebula. So actually the literature in, the, in this topic has been rejuvenated in this 20 years because uh, Sakurai's object. So we are seeing the evolution in real time of this source uh, now. The term born again, it comes from uh, 1983 with, when uh, Eco Even and collaborators there at the University of Illinois where I, I stayed produced this paper and they suggested that some central star may experience a final thermal pulse when they are already on the cooling uh, white dwarf track. Of course, this is not the helium shell flash that happens when, when the star is on the AGB. It has all the envelope on top. And when this uh, happens on the AGB, you really see nothing very uh, obvious outside of the star. But here, the thermal pulse is not restrained by the stellar envelope. So this is a, a very violent explosion. And in order to, to simulate this uh, explosion, you need to have powerful computers to to build this simulation and, oh sorry, it's not this one, it's these simulations. So it's an explosion which, which is happening on the surface of the star, so those are models made by Goodward and collaborators, they claim this is like, they call global oscillation of the shell hydrogen, gosh, injection and, and burning. So you have the star here, it's like uh, the central core of carbon and oxygen is transparent on this uh, models, and what you see here is the, the helium shell which is ingesting hydrogen from the top. So as the time proceeds, so there is um, more and more material which is ingested, temperatures rise up, and then there is finally a very uh, sudden explosion which is going to eject the very highly processed material outside of the, <coughs> of the star. Typically, we see that the, the time for the star to recover, so the star ejects the material uh, at some moment here, then goes back to the AGB, so this is why we call a born again event. And basically the star will recover very quickly its temperature. So we see the temperature of the central star of about 30, about 78, even about 58, are, those are hot stars. But in the case of HUBI1, we've seen that at least for 15 years, it's about the same temperature. And so we realized, we ran some uh, codes, and we realized that when you have a low mass progenitor, they make loops here at this point of the uh, HR diagram. So actually, what we claim is that we have seen a born again event, which is associated to a low mass progenitor. Our calculations say that this is like 10% more massive than, than the sun. And now we see the star here at this point where its temperature is 38,000 Kelvin. So uh, those are the different mass loss rate. And so everything matches with what's typical or um, accepted for these kinds of, of events. So it, it occurred. And the star at that moment ejected something like 10 to the minus 5 solar masses, of which about half of this was carbon, pure carbon. So that's the, the why there is something going on different here in HUBU, HUBA1. What are the implications for the stellar evolution? Well, the first thing that we have realized is that this kind of event may happen to our sun to stars like our sun. And this is going to change completely the, uh, the statistics that we make about a born again uh, event. So this is also, we are connecting the way how a hydrogen-rich central star of a planetary nebula may become 
a WC, a carbon-rich hydrogen poor central star of planetary nebula. So far we have this kind of two populations and we don't know how the stars go from one to the other or whether it's nature or nurture or this is evolution or not. So here this is an example of one star that we believe it was hydrogen rich and now have, has become uh, carbon rich. So it's increasing the yield of carbon. Oh, that's a, just a bit. And what's very important is that maybe there is a hidden population of born again, of sources that they have experienced a final or late or very late thermal pulse. So this is about 30. You don't see the picture very well, but this is a very old PN. Um, it was realized that there was something going on there because there was some structure inside and there was a lot of infrared emission. Of course, if you are a very evolved PN, something like this, it's very difficult for you to hide a born again event. So if something happened to the central star, you immediately are going to catch it because those are low densities and everything is very transparent. But if you are something like this, a sort which is younger and denser, uh, that shell is able to, to absorb more quickly the properties of the, of the boragain, and so maybe you are not going to be able to, to see this. And there are evidence that some, uh, that, well, basically that the planetary nebula whose central star have this WC square bracket uh, type have something different. First, they have higher turbulence and expansion velocities than typical planetary nebulae. Also, they have a different chemistry. They typically have larger carbon and nitrogen abundances. You see those stars, they are really with, in a situation where they are different from uh, sources that they have a typical composition of, of, the, of planetary nebulae. This is telling us that in these events, there is an injection of kinetic energy and highly processed material, which is at some moment absorbed by the PN. We may not see the, the knots and the, the clumps there, but there is something different going on on this source. And it has been also associated with the mixed CO chemistry of some planetary nebulae. In some cases, you see uh, that, the, well, actually, you see that the WC stars, they have uh, dust which are both carbonaceous and oxygen-rich. And this is something that has not been really well understood uh, so far. Ursula de Marco also found, found the same. Also, Perea Calderon claimed that this is something which happened to all, all PNs. So there is something going on there, which is, so the dog is waving the tail and something is, is happening. We are currently working on this uh, source. There are several works going on. The first thing we want to, to understand are the infrared properties of the ejecta, because this is going to tell us the amount of dust and the chemical composition of the dust. And this is going to tell us, it's going to provide details of the, of the ejecta, of the geometry of the ejecta, but also on the amount of that and chemical composition, which is telling us details of the VLTP uh, event. So we've been recently awarded the DDT VLTP CIRT time, and this is a work which Jesus Toala is preparing. We are also investigating the dust production in time. You have seen that the, we have spectra of the central star in different time, and you see that the star is dimming, but this is not, it's not a gray. Uh, obscuration. It, it's coming from the blue to the red. So it has a very peculiar absorption properties. And that's something that we want to, to investigate to see what are the properties of the uh, thick veil of material between the star and, and us. This is Gerardo Ramos Larius who is doing that. The physical properties of the outer shell are really very intriguing. We think it's one of the coldest uh, ionized nebula in the, in the universe. And so we have of them uh, GTC or Cities spectra. Um, we have now some numbers on the, on the temperature, and this is really something very, very amazing. It's a situation of non-equilibrium for the nebular astrophysics. That's something that we 
find in very few places in the, in the universe. In this case, it's Xuan Fang, now at the University of Hong Kong, who's leading this, this work. And finally, we have started to search for this hidden population of uh, LTP or VLTP sources, and we have the first candidate. It's a PN that so far has been, well, has been, uh, there are many studies, and there is something going on there. And we think that we can explain everything if we assume that was an, an LTP at some moment, and then it evolved with time, so that now it's kind of um, a hidden there. It's being erased by the, by the time. There are two more words. One of is the chemical composition of the inner shell, because this is also associated to, to the uh, VLTP, to the uh, details of, uh, of the thermal pulse there. Um, well, we expected to have HST observation, but now HST is on hold, so um, I don't know whether this is going to be uh, carried out in, in the future, but we want to study the, the expansion of the inner shell because this is going to tell us exactly the age of the, of the event, assuming this is a ballistic ejection. Of course, we already have some kinematics with, uh, obtained with the mass shell spectra, and if we look here at the nitrogen 2 line, this is the the and slit going east west, and you see that at the position of the of the central star, at the position of the center, there is a collimated outflow there, with at least a um, velocity of 250 kilometers in and zero uh, full width maximum. So there is something that has been ejected there, which is probably associated with the shocked material that that we see. So just to to conclude. HUBI1, it's really a truly unique planetary nebula because it's inverted ionization structure and because the recombination of the, of the outer shell. And we believe this is caused by a shock from, from material that was ejected from a, from a very late thermal pulse. The central star is really a truly unique case of stellar evolution. And we see the evolution in time of, of this star as we see also the evolution of the, of the nebula. That may be the missing link for, to understand cool WC bracket square stars in planetary nebula that they are more turbulent and carbon and nitrogen uh, rich. So this is a textbook for studies of the physics of shocks, ionization, dust formation, and nebular and stellar evolution. Uh, that's another cover that we sent to Nature Astronomy. We sent several ideas to them. And so we see here like a cardiogram. But actually, this is the true luminosity of the helium flash during, the, during this, this event. And now it's time for questions. Thank you. Questions, comments, claims? Enrique? That's good. Because these stars are so common, um, uh, how many comparing the uh, time scales of this fa uh, fast phase? Um, uh, how many stars uh, do you? How, how many objects of this type do you expect to see? Because this is only the first one. So, how, how if you uh, you're looking for them? How many do you expect to have based on the duty cycle? in the galaxy that we have images, that we have spectra, so that we have some information about them. And up to now, there were just four more, again, planetary numbers. So this is the fifth. So this is telling you that really the, the duty cycle of everything, it's very fast, maybe uh, 
1,000, let's say 1,000 year. Plus, you have that this is not going to happen in all the central star of planet Earth nebula. You have to build the helium shell with the critical mass to explode during this time. And so this is going to be maybe uh, another 10%. So we expect that maybe 10% times 20%, um, so that's going to be maybe a few percent of the, of the PM. So far, the number of WC square brackets, it's something like 10, 15% of planetary nuclei. And so that, it's going to provide you like um, um, a broad number of how many of those we can, we can expect. So if something like this happened early in the formation of the PN, maybe the signs have already been erased. We're going to be able to, to, see, to see that. So it really depends on, on, the, on the evolution of the event and, and the nebula. The question is that before we found those just in very old evolved sources just because uh, where, when something happened no more than 1,000 years ago because it was very easy to spot the evidence for this. So the evidence may be not that um, um, certain, but we need to look at the, 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 the details because maybe there is something going on there. It's very, very peculiar, that, uh, and this is something that nobody can answer so far. When you look at these uh, events, they typically have a geometry of uh, something like a disk, equatorial disk, and bipolar ejection. Um, and the bipolar ejection are, are very, very fast. Um, I, I believe that some of the fast outflows that we see in planetary nebula, they might be associated with these kind of events. Not all, some, a few, maybe. Uh, in this uh, dimming of the central star and uh, changing uh, shape, uh, how do you measure the temperature, the effective temperature of the star? Yeah. And also, if it is shock, uh, ionized, how do you measure the abundances of the ejector? Well, we need to rely on mapping code, because this is going to tell us what's, what are the, the, the abundances. Uh, there is a problem, too. Uh, these are shocks, but the shocks are not relaxed. So we need to, to take this also into, into account. Christophe Morissette is making the, the numbers for me, and I know that there is a, um, a range of, that's why we want to go to the infrared to look, to look at the dust, to look for carbonaceous uh, features in the infrared spectra, and try to derive the chemical abundances from different uh, points of view. is 38,000 plus, oh, that's non-LT models. Helga Todd from the Potsdam University used the POWR code. Carbon two, carbon three lines, the, the shape of the Balmer lines in the, in the spectrum of the star. Uh, uh, different features there. I mean, if you if you have carbon two line, you have carbon three, but you don't have carbon four in the center star, then you know that your temperature is going, is not going to be very high. So those are the the, the parameters that we are using. Okay, okay. <clears throat> I have uh, two questions. Uh, first one, let me see if I understood correctly. Are, are you suggesting that? Uh, Planetary nebulae with uh, central stars of type WC have gone all through uh, this type of event? There is a theory about this. There is a uh, some people claim that if you have a WC square, they have all gone through a uh, an, an thermal pulse. It might be an AGB final thermal pulse, so when when it's becoming, it's going from the AGB to the post-AGB, it happened there, or it may be later on as an LTP or BLTP. This is something that I, I'm not saying. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model. I'm asking because we have an object which is very strange, which is, has a central star of that type, and uh, it has water maser, which is, which is supposed to happen only in very young planetary nebulae, but 
seems to be much older because it's very extended. So it doesn't fit with it. So rejuvenated like this. I mean, there is an injection, and, and uh, as I was claiming, the, the event itself is very complex. It's, um, and depending on the amount of hydrogen and helium that you have, you are going to produce an injector with different chemical composition. In ABEL 30, ABEL um, 78, uh, ABEL 58, we thought there was no hydrogen at all. But we, we took a look at the uh, submillimeter observation with Daniel Tafoya, and we found some uh, hydrogen uh, species, HCN, and some other species there in the ejecta, which is kind of, well, at the end there is some hydrogen which may produce this material. Typically, there is very little oxygen, and that's because the, the explosion is so, it takes hours, so there is no time for helium to combine into carbon and then into oxygen. So there is typically little uh, oxygen. But maybe there was oxygen on the, on the nebular envelope that may mix there. So. The question is whether uh, there are any radio data about in, in this source, because you could reach a higher angular resolution and go into the, to the inner part. We, uh, we are planning now to try to get some uh, radio data with the GTM first. Um, and then try to proceed to, to ALMA. But once that we know that what's the, the brightness of the solar, there were some observations with uh, uh, the BLBI and there was no detection, I think. So it's, if there is radio emission, it's, it's very, uh, it's faint. It's in the free, free emission. Okay. It's in the faint in the, in the radio. Thank you very much, Martin. Very nice talk. Um, I've, um, you've said that you have four objects that could be the same kind of... You, you've said that you have four objects that could be rejuvenated, I mean, new born again planetary nebula. Now the, 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 the select of born again planetary nebula is five with this uh, HUBI1. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, are those all the five objects, or four? I mean, four in this in this case, similar to this one, or there's no data available for them, or how they do compare? Among them? The other four, they have some similarities among among them. Also, I have studied those for for some time, and they seems to be like on, on an evolutionary sequence. Abel 30 and Abel 78, it seems they they experience this born again event. Some, something like 1,000 years ago. Abel 58, it was the Nova Aquila 1919, so it, it's about next year is going to be 100 years. And Sakurai happened uh, just 20 years ago. So we have like an evolutionary sequence there for these uh, four sources. In this case, it's different in the sense that those sources the central star has recovered very quickly to very high temperature, like 100,000 Kelvin. In, in the case of uh, Abel 58, it was something like a few years after the, the, the event, the Nova-like uh, Nova uh, event. Here, it's taking more time, so it's telling us that this is kind of a different population of central star which is experiencing this. This event. The others, actually, some of them, they are not even WC, they are a PG-1159, so those are different kind of stars. So they are also um, hydrogen poor, but it's, they don't have broad uh, features of water yet, but this is probably because the, the fast uh, evolution. So how do you get the second initiation of helium? You have the, the core of carbon and oxygen, and when the star left the, the AGB, there is a shell of helium, and then there is another shell of hydrogen. So during the horizontal post-AGB track, uh, the star gets the energy from the burning of hydrogen 
and this burning of hydrogen is feeding the helium shell. So it may happen that at the end you have like 80% of the, in the helium shell, 80% of the mass necessary for a helium shell flash, and then nothing happens. So the star evolves and cools down. But in some cases you get to this 100% of the mass that you need for the helium to start uh, burning, and this is going to produce the, the helium shell uh, flash. The, I mean, in, in the external shell of the nebula, yeah. the ionized helium 4686 that you detect, yes. how do you ionize it? Shocks. The shocks. shocks, yes, because the shock is propagating into an already ionized nebula. 54 electron Yes, yes, with mapping, we show that you only need something like 70 kilometers per second. You know that the shocks, it's very dependent to the velocity of the shock, but also to the pre-ionization conditions. If you already have a helium which is ionized, then you don't need too much velocity to ionize uh, up to helium-2. Another question? No one? Okay, yeah, last question is, okay, you say that, for example, one signature that should be associated to this kind of object is uh, really the, uh, you know, the, uh, how to say, the... Some bipolar. Exactly, some bipolar reaction. All right, so uh, do you have another easily observable tracer for selecting candidates? One important is uh, infrared emission, dust. So these stars, they typically have some dust which is kept inside the, the shell. So the, the new PN that we have detected, actually you see the, the optical emission, the ionized emission, and then there is PAH emission inside the shell. And there, for some t time, people were claiming that there was a veil of carbon, so the star was kind of blinking here and there. And there is also another feature that now I realize that sometimes you have a, a central star with a temperature and the electronic temper or the, the excitation of the nebula is different. It, it does not match the central star. So you have a, a central star which is uh, hotter, but the nebula outside is not excited as for the so basically, the, there is a difference between the, temper, the effective temperature of the central star and the Sanstra temperature that you derive from the nebular emission line. So sometimes there is a, a really different mismatch there. And this is telling you that there is non-equilibrium nebular uh, processes going on there. So this is telling you that maybe for some time the star disappear, the nebula evolve, and then the star is going back to to a different situation. So that's a, so dust, um, a turbulence, and, and so on, and also this kind of mismatch between the temperature and the uh, excitation conditions of the nebula. I suppose you have filtered some of the catalogs looking for that. Right. Yes. OK, for the next talk. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much. Uh, we are, thanks again to the speaker. Uh,